Hey, today we are in the midst of a sermon series called Processing Doubt. And let me just say where we've been and where we're going. Uh, the first week we just said, hey, here's what doubt is, and uh, here's uh, where it comes from, here's what you can do about it. We kind of had that conversation. Then last week we just talked about the reality of Jesus. Uh, Jesus was indeed a real person, and he makes this claim that he is the Messiah, the promised one of the Old Testament. We looked at that claim, explored that claim a little bit. Uh, today we're going to be looking at some of the things that Jesus said, because I would contend that the words of Jesus and the way we often relate to those words in our modern culture, two pretty different things. So we're going to look at that. And then next week going forward, we're going to look at uh, the whole idea of objective truth and is the Bible a legitimate source of that objective truth. Then February 5th, this one's kind of a hot button issue in our world today. What about Christian morality? Is it just like really crazy outdated? Is it time that God kind of get over it? You know, what's because you know, this makes us stand out and be so unique from others around us. And then last of all, just to look at church history, or, or the church has a past. And uh, how do we process that past in light of uh, kind of where we are today as a culture? So that's where we're going. And uh, today digging into uh, some of the words and some of the teachings of Jesus. So we're going to be in the Gospels uh, the whole morning. Uh, grab a Bible. You, I think our first verse is in the book of Mark. You can open to the book of Mark if you'd like. You can also follow along the screens. You can use your device if you would like. If you don't have a Bible app, download the church app. There's a Bible feature on it. All right. Let's get started. Let's pray. And then we're going to dig right in. Lord, thank you so much for the chance to be together today. It's raining outside, but we're able to be in here together as a church family, dry and able to concentrate and hear your word. Uh, we recognize your word is powerful. We recognize its truth, and we recognize that it has the, the capacity to change our life if we'll let it. And so I just pray, Lord, for every person in this space today that we will be open to that possibility that you might have a different path for us than what we might anticipate or imagine. We love you, Father, and we pray this in the great name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So back in the 1950s, there was a guy named Art Clocky, and he was graduating from USC with a degree in animation. And during his lifetime, Art had experienced some real hardship. Uh, his dad had died when he was uh, just eight years old, and... Um, he kind of bounced around a little bit from his father to his mother, and after a time, he was living with his dad. His dad went on uh, to pass away. Sorry, they divorced first, and then, then his dad later passed away. His mom's new husband didn't like him, and so after about a year or so of living with his stepfather, uh, his stepfather turned him into a children's home. That's a tough way to go, isn't it? At age 11, he was adopted, though, by a great guy. He was a music composer who loved the Lord. And um, after he stint in the military during World War II, he goes off to USC, and he falls in love with something called stop-motion clay animation. Okay? This is kind of an obscure art form at the time, but he just thought it was the neatest thing in the world. And a couple of years after he graduated, he created this character that goes on to become absolutely iconic. And the character's name is Gumby, okay? Oh yeah, Gumby. Gumby was modeled after a gingerbread man. That's where he got the inspiration for how do I shape Gumby. And his feet were real fat and wide so that he would actually be able to stand up on a table so they could take pictures of him and create this type of animation. So he couldn't have skinny legs, he had to have big fat legs. Uh, his head was slanted in honor of his late father. And if you see the picture there, you understand, you get it. It makes all kinds of sense, right? And so he, he creates this character. It gets picked up. NBC falls in love with it. They order 25 11-minute-long episodes. And for years, Gumby is a staple of children's programming. The Gumby show goes on to be a real hit and a real success all during the 60s. And even during the 70s, it's a staple of children's programming. Just has a really great long run there. And then come along to 1982, and it seems like Gumby's going to kind of fade into obscurity, but no, it doesn't happen. Saturday Night Live does a big sketch on Gumby and Pokey. Keep, keep going. You, you kind of feel about There we are. Okay, there's Saturday Night Live right there. They do this sketch on the Gumby show, and it is just huge. And uh, it 
it launches a whole new set of Gumby TV shows. Uh, the, the, the Adventures of Gumby, they're called. And uh, that comes on, goes on to be a big thing. And Gumby winds up, he winds up being the spokesperson for the Library of Congress. He winds up on Cheerio boxes. That's, it's hard to see there, but you can see the little finger there pointing to it. Uh, and then after that, there's a children's book, Gumby Goes to the Sun, which is just, that was a hot trip is what that was. That was, that was amazing. Then there's a, a comic book series. I love the fact there's 3D glasses. It makes me want to just read the comic. I mean, how cool would a 3D comic book uh, be? And then there was the video game. Gumby versus the Astrobots. I mean, that became a deal. And in the 1990s, Nickelodeon and uh, the, com- the uh, uh, Cartoon Network pick up Gumby. In 1995, there becomes a movie. Okay, it is uh, the Gumby, the movie it's released. And just last year, Fox announced that they've picked up all of the rights to Gumby. And you can now see Gumby on any Fox network. So if you want to go and stream Gumby, you can like binge Gumby all day long. I want to hear from you all that many of you all have pulled a full-blown binge on Gumby and you're all up to date on Gumby and Pokey and the blockheads and the whole, the whole bunch. So here we are 70 years later and Gumby is still a thing, right? But my favorite aspect of Gumby as a kid growing up, was not the TV show or the movie or or any of that stuff. My favorite thing about Gumby was the toys. I'm not going to lie to you. I had a Gumby and a Pokey toy, and I thought they were the coolest thing in the world. Because what, what could you do with a Gumby toy? Does anybody remember? You could bend that puppy any way you wanted. Take a look, right? You could absolutely twist... Gumby into a knot. It was amazing, and that's what made Gumby so lovable. And and to this day, okay, to this day, Gumby is still just synonymous with flexible. In fact, if you're in the video world, in the camera world, you can actually go online and you can order a Gumby mount for your camera. And its legs are just these rubbery legs that you can then twist around, whatever you want to twist them around, get the thing in exactly the right shape to hold your camera wherever you want, however you want. The the idea, the, the name Gumby just means flexible. And if you really are that into it, you could even go and get yourself a t- sweatshirt like this one. This is available right now. So maybe next weekend, some of you all will be wearing this to church, right? And you can just rock the idea that Gumby is so twisted and so flexible. Now, right now, some of y'all are wondering, dude, we are talking today about the words of Jesus. Will this dog ever hunt? I mean, will you ever get to the point? And the answer is, yeah, I'm going to get to it. And here's the connection between Gumby and the words of Jesus. A lot of people, a lot of people treat the words of Jesus the same way that they would treat Gumby, okay? We take the words of Jesus and we want to just be able to twist them any way that we want so that they will look however we want in order to make ourselves comfortable with what it is that Jesus has to say, okay? We just want to be able to bend it and make it mean whatever we want. I just think about some of the common expressions that we can attribute back to Jesus. The good Samaritan, the prodigal son, the blind leading the blind. Judge not lest you be judged. If you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Wolves in sheep clothing, cast the first stone, go the extra mile, eat, drink, and be merry. Jesus either originated or made popular all of those expressions. And a lot of people want to take expressions just like that, words of Jesus. They want to latch onto them. They want to bend them and make them whatever they want them to be. And the result is that the image of Jesus that is left over is unauthentic. It's twisted. It's not an accurate reflection on who Jesus is or what Jesus had to say at all. Now, let me give you a high-profile example, okay, of what I'm just talking about here. Back in September... Um, during his re-election bid, Governor Gavin Newsom of California ran a series of billboards uh, that was promoting California as a destination state for abortions. And Here's the ad. Take a look at it. And it says, need an abortion, California's ready to help. And what you can't tell from there, because it's just the print's so small, is what it says across the bottom of the billboard. It's a scripture verse. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. So 
he's trying to make this point that, hey, if you really love your neighbor, you'll make a way for them to receive an abortion. Now, you and I might disagree about the stakes of abortion or its legitimacy as a form of birth control, but can we all agree? Can we all agree that when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he wasn't guaranteeing the right to an abortion? Can we agree to that? And can we agree that that is somebody who's projecting their own values onto Jesus, that it's somebody who took something that Jesus said, and they just twisted it around to mean whatever they wanted it to mean? They took the words of Jesus, they treated them like Gumby or like Pokey and made it to something that <laughs> it wasn't at all. Okay, now, if we're honest, it's possible that you and I can sometimes approach the words of Jesus in much the same way, can't we? If we're honest, sometimes we want to reshape the words of Jesus until they just make us comfortable with where we are, what we believe, what we want, and we can disregard Jesus' power, and we can reduce him to a Gumby toy so that we can make Jesus into what we want. And I would submit to you that this is uh, particularly true if we're dealing with the words of Jesus that are in contrast to what we want or to how we see ourselves, okay? And if you're processing doubt today, I just want you to dig in because we're going to look at a couple of different times, a couple of different ways that we look at the words of Jesus, we find them incredibly uncomfortable because they're telling us the difficult truth about ourselves. And we want to just take those words and we just want to reshape them into something of our own being. Okay, so instead of doing that today, can we just take these words of Jesus head on, okay? And as we do that, I just want you to honestly ask yourself, just a little bit of honest self-assessment. Just ask yourself as we look at some of these sayings from Jesus and just say, is that me? All right? Are you with me? Think we can do it? First thing I want us to consider is Jesus' assessment of the human heart. Okay? What does Jesus say about the human heart? Look at Mark chapter 7, verse 20. Then he said, What comes out of a person, that defiles him. For from within, for from within out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, Thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, promiscuity, stinginess, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a person. So Jesus just contrasts his words here about the human heart with how we see the human heart. For most people, I think most people would say, oh, the human heart is like a built-in GPS system. Right? And this is reinforced over and over again in culture. We reinforce it when we're talking to one another, especially at a point when we're making a decision. Right? Somebody's making a decision. They want to know, do I go to Florida or do I go to FSU? Which, in my view, there is no choice here to make. Right? It's clear and obvious you should go to FSU. But let's just say someone is struggling with that particular dilemma. And someone might look at them and they might say to them what? Follow your heart. Right? And the idea here is that, that your heart is inside of you. And it's just this infallible GPS. And as long as you're being true to your heart, as long as you're being true to yourself, you're going to be just fine. But let's just be honest. How many times in our life have we seen that not work out? How many times have our lives just completely blown up, right? Because we followed our heart. How many times have you dated the wrong guy or the wrong girl because you followed your heart? Well, there's some serious regret, right? Okay. How many times have you wound up in the wrong job? How many times have you wound up in the wrong city? All because you followed your heart. And Jesus says, listen, I just want you to understand, your heart is not this ultra-reliable GPS. In fact, your heart is fundamentally flawed. It's wicked. Now, why would Jesus say this? Well, it goes into the understanding from the Old Testament about what the human heart actually is, Okay. The human heart, in the Old Testament point of view, is sort of the seat of our desire. So when you see something that you want, okay, and that drive to achieve whatever you want, that is all coming from, in the Old Testament worldview, your heart, okay? So whatever goal it might be that you want to obtain, whether it, again, whether it might be a dating relationship or a financial objective or whatever it might be, once that thing kind of gets percolating inside of you, your body then locks onto it. And if the desire is strong enough, you will do anything to achieve that goal, right, to make it happen. Are you with me? 
Okay? That is the human heart. And your human heart can lead you astray because it gives way to that overwhelming desire. Simple example for you. Let's say that you are in the market for an inexpensive used car. And so you go to the car dealership, right? And you're waiting for the salesperson to come over and greet you. And, you know, so that you can tell him what a cheapskate you are and how you want a car with four wheels, a motor, and that's really about it. I mean, you are looking for bare bones transportation, right? That's what you want. That's what you feel like you need. Maybe it's a car for your son, for your daughter, and you are going to get this done on the absolute cheap. So you're standing in the showroom waiting to talk to the salesperson, and there sits a brand new 2023 model 4 million, right? It's just gorgeous. It's just stunning. And you look at it, and you begin to drink it in. You think, you know, that's a new color that they just came out with this year. And then you go, and the safety features. I mean, I need 47 airbags. I, I, I need that, you know? And then it's got all the electronics. It's, it will talk to me. It'll have a conversation with me. No one else wants to talk to me, but this car will, okay? I can even give it a name. I can call it Alexis, and she's going to treat me right. And, you know, all right? And, and you decide, you know what? I'm going to give my old car to my 16-year-old, and I'm going to take this one right here. And by the time the salesperson come, comes over to you, it says, can I help you? And you can say, yes, you can. You can just back this out right now. I am taking this home. Now, what happened? You went in there to buy an inexpensive car. What happened? Your heart got involved. And your heart led you astray. Does it sound familiar? And Jesus knows that what our hearts are capable of, and he knows how deceitful they can be. So Jesus says, hey, I'm not going to just affirm every decision that comes out of your heart. I'm going to tell you the truth about your heart. And the truth about your heart is that your heart will get you into all kinds of trouble. Look back at the list of where Jesus says our heart can lead us. There in verse 21, out of people's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, promiscuity, stinginess, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Ouch. Jesus says, hey man, your heart is not an infallible GPS. Your heart is a train wreck. And he says, instead of fulfillment, your heart's actually going to lead you to defilement. Look at verse 23. All these evil things come from within and defile a person. Following your heart could lead to a huge setback because the human heart is fundamentally flawed. And Jesus comes along and he blows up this popular notion that we have that, that our heart can always be relied on and all we have to do is follow it and whatever comes out of me is going to be great. And Jesus says, no, it's not that way. Your heart needs to be watched. You need to keep an eye on it. You're not nearly as trustworthy as you think. So Jesus goes on and he says, listen, you not only have a heart problem, but you also have a vision problem, meaning we can seldom see the truth about our own spiritual condition. Take a look in, in Matthew chapter 5, you can go ahead, or rather chapter 7 rather, go ahead and find that. Matthew chapter 5 through, verse, through chapter 7 are the Sermon on the Mount. And it's the greatest sermon in all of human history. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lays out a lot of material. He lays out how we can live a life that's pleasing to God and how to be happy and how to deal with conflict and how to protect our marriage and on and on it goes. As he gets near the, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he brings it to this kind of shocking conclusion. Look at Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it, did not, it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house. 
and it collapsed, and its collapse was great. Wow. You know, that's kind of a nasty way to kind of bring this incredible sermon to a close. And Jesus, as he wraps this thing up, he says, some of you have no hope in eternity. Some of you think you're spiritually okay. Some of you talk a really good game, but spiritually, you're going to be like a flimsy house in a hurricane. And according to Jesus, a lot of people who think they've got it all figured out are going to be turned away when they stand on the threshold of eternity. I would submit to you that is a vision problem, right? We just don't have an honest self-assessment of who we are spiritually. And I'm wondering, as I'm looking at these words of Jesus, how can we be so far off in our view of ourselves? And earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, the problem is that we mistake what is easy for what is godly. Take a look at Matthew 7, verse 13. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How, many, how narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Uh, let's be honest. For most of us, if we have the choice between what is easy and what is hard, we're going to choose easy most every time, right? I first moved to Tallahassee, it was actually 17 years ago this month, okay? And uh, so I moved here, and we live kind of out in the country. We have three acres. It's really great. It's a great place to raise a little boy. There's woods around, and it's just fun. And uh, we're mowing about an acre. Now, I'm a lot younger at the time, and I also know that my son is getting to that wonderful, blessed age where he can mow grass, okay? So as I'm looking at my yard, I decide to get a push mower, okay? So I'm pushing out about an acre. This is a lot of years ago, y'all. I'm pushing out about an acre, no problem, by myself. And then the job gets exponentially easier because my son is really eager, like a lot of young boys are. He's really eager to mow the grass. He's like, Dad, let me mow, let me mow. And I'm like, I don't know, son. Then finally it's like, well, okay, you know, and, and I let him mow. And now he's mowing, and I'm, in, I'm living the life. Well, it's not long of CJ mowing the grass before he comes to me and he says, Dad, we need a different lawnmower. We need a riding lawnmower. That's what we need. And I'm like, son, why? Why do I need to buy a riding lawnmower? I have you, right? You are better than any riding lawnmower. So this goes on for years, and as my son's senior year of high school approaches, we downsize, okay? We, we move to a different part of town, uh, a much smaller home, and this time we have a one-acre yard, and we're mowing most all of it. So let's say we're mowing three-quarters of an acre, so a bit less than we were mowing before. But this time, as I come into this new house, I'm looking at my lawnmower that we've used all those years, and it's pretty rickety, and it's pretty shot. I'm also looking at my son. What grade did I say he was in? He's a senior in high school. And this has great meaning for me, okay, as I consider my future and mowing the grass, okay? So my brand new lawnmower that I buy to handle my brand new, slightly smaller yard is a riding lawnmower because I am no fool, right? So this thing comes, okay, it's shipped freight, and, uh, you know, I get it off the crate. It's been set in my, in my driveway. I get it off the crate and get it all oiled up and cranked up and, you know, off the skids and all that good stuff. And CJ comes home from school to see the new lawnmower. And he walks around the corner and goes, hey, that's a riding lawnmower. I said, you've been asking for one for years. Here it is. He said, but I'm not going to be around to use it. Oh, man, I am so sorry about the way that worked out. Why did I switch to a riding lawnmower? And don't say because you're older. Why did I switch to a riding lawnmower? It's easy, right? Easy makes all the sense in the world when you're mowing your grass. Easy does not make sense when you're talking about following Jesus. Because Jesus says, listen, you need to understand that following me, following me is, it's a narrow road. Following me is the more difficult road. And you need to have enough vision to see who you really are. You need to have enough vision to say, I'm going to follow Christ in such a way that I allow God to do something real in my life. In other words, as I follow Jesus, it's actually going to make an impact on me. And that impact is going to be 
noticeable. And you can tell, you can tell if God is at work in your life by taking a look at what you're actually producing, what it is that's coming out the pipe of your life. Matthew 7, verse 17 says, Every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so you'll recognize them by their fruit. And Jesus is saying, hey, listen, a person who's truly a Christ follower is going to produce what Jesus calls on us to produce. It's going to show up in real and tangible ways in the way that you live your life. It's going to show up in the way that you forgive. It's going to show up in what you value. It's going to show up in your moral decisions. It's going to show up in the words that you say. It's going to show up when you get excited about the same thing that God is excited about. And you can see it as God goes to work from the inside out, changing your life and bearing fruit. And Jesus' analysis of our heart and our vision is disturbing because we have in our minds this popular image of Jesus that he just signs on to whatever it is that we're doing. That no matter what it is that we're throwing his way, he just looks at us and goes, well, there, there, it's all good. It's okay. You followed your heart. It's all all right. And that's just simply not what Scripture teaches us. It doesn't affirm that. When we, when we grab onto what we think Jesus means and we twist it into our own image, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't affirm that. And thinking that way is to take what Jesus said and to twist it into something it's not. Because while it is true that Jesus invites everyone everywhere to come to him just as we are, he doesn't leave us just as we were. And to deny that is to deny the truth about who Jesus is and who we are. So the question is, what do we do with Jesus' assessment? And you all, I would argue that some of the most important decisions that we ever make in our lifetime happen when we are confronted from, by someone who truly loves us, who truly cares about us. In fact, they care about us enough to tell us the truth about who we really are, right? A lot of years ago, I was, you know, in my 30s, and in those days, um, I had a lot younger knees and so forth than I have now, and I was running a lot of miles in those days. I was a very, very avid runner, and I was in, you know, really good shape because of it. But as I crossed the, the, the line of my 40s, I fell deeply and passionately in love with donuts, and I fell out of love with running, and so... Strangely enough, my body began to slowly shift from looking like a finely oiled machine that ran mile after mile to looking more like a donut. You know, it, it's true. You are what you eat. You know, and, and so I began to, to look very donut-like, okay? And, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty obvious. And uh, I would go to my doctor because I'm in my 40s and it's time for me to get serious about checkups, right? So I go to my doctor and I had this real young doctor. This was in Kansas City at the time. And I had this really young, athletic, good-looking doctor. And I chose him because he just, he reminded me of myself, right? You know, he was just this, this, I'm, okay, thank y'all for laughing, but... But I, in seriousness, I wanted a doctor who understood running and all of that kind of thing, and, and he was a runner himself. And so I go to him, and he, he does the blood work and he, all the data and everything, and he says to me, i got to be honest with you, David. Now, that is never a good way for a doctor to begin his report to you after his exam. He says, i got to be honest with you, David. Your weight, your blood work, so forth. None of it is on healthy trajectory right now. None of it. You don't have a problem today. But if you don't change something, you'll have a problem tomorrow. And I walked out of his office and I thought, who does that punk think he is? Right? I mean, my goodness, he's just barely out of med school, right? And I go home and I'm frustrated. I got to admit, I'm a little frosty. And as I'm home, I go upstairs in the bedroom and I walk by the full-length mirror. 
that Pam has, because I never look at the thing. You, you all are probably thinking, yes, we can tell, okay? I walk by the full-length mirror, and I stop, and I just take a good hard look. And you know what I saw? I saw that my doctor was right. And I had to admit, if I was going to turn this around, right, I was going to have to set myself on the narrow, uncomfortable road. That was the right path for me. And you and I need to do the same thing when we consider the words of Jesus. Jesus has said that you and I have a heart condition and that our heart is the source of so many things that bring destruction to our lives and to the lives of others. Jesus tells us that we have a vision problem and that our own self-assessment about who we think we are can't be trusted. And we need to look at ourselves carefully through the eyes of Jesus Christ. And you all, these words are uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable. And we can take them and we can twist them and we can tell ourselves, well, the words of Jesus don't apply to me. They, they actually apply to somebody else. And we can, can bend the words of Jesus so that what we hear is that we are okay exactly the way that we are. Or we can realize that Jesus is telling us the truth about ourselves. And we can realize that when someone loves you enough to tell you the truth about what you really are, so that you cannot stay in that place. Well, that's what love really, really looks out like, isn't it? So today, I want to just challenge you. Go home and sit down and take a good, hard look in the mirror. Guys, maybe in your bedroom, there's that long mirror that your wife uses that you never even look at. Just stand in front of the mirror and ask yourself, if I were to sit down with Jesus the way that I would a good doctor, what would he say about my heart? What would he say about my spiritual condition? And do you see what a healing moment that could be? And you might be thinking, David, I don't want any part of that. I think I'm just better off not knowing. I think I'm just better off believing that Jesus just comes along and affirms anything that I want. I don't know if I can do it. But I promise you, like a, a doctor who desperately wants his patient to be well, Jesus cares enough about you to tell you the truth about who you are. So don't just be satisfied to twist the words of Jesus to fit your own needs. Open yourself up to the power and the beauty and the truth of what Jesus has to say to you. Because not only does Jesus love you enough to tell you the truth about you are, he also loves you enough to come from heaven to earth and pay the penalty for our sin so that you can be free from condemnation. And he loves you enough to issue you an invitation, an invitation just for you to begin an entire new life that's filled with hope and with healing and direction and meaning. I love these words of Jesus. You probably do too. John 3, 16, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And you might be thinking about the difficult words of Jesus, and you might be thinking, why is he so condemning? He's not condemning you. He's just telling you the truth and extends a way for you to enjoy new life. And I just want to encourage you today to have enough integrity to sit down and just take on the truth of the words of Jesus Christ and ask what it means to embrace those words and what it would mean to put them into effect in your life today. Let's pray together right now. Father, thank you for our chance to be together today. And we just pray that you grant us the boldness to stand in front of a mirror today and just say, Jesus, show me the truth about my heart. Show me the truth about my standing before God. And Lord, grant me the courage to give it all to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.